Hello, and welcome to the LSE public lecture event entitled The Future of Work in Africa, which is part of the LSE Shaping the Post-COVID World Series. This event is co-hosted by the Firoz Lauji Center for Africa and the organization Move Me Back. To tell you a little bit about us, the Firoz Lauji Center for Africa promotes independent academic research and teaching open and issue orientated uh, debate and evidence-based policy making. The center connects social science disciplines and works in partnership with Africa, African colleagues to bring African voices to global debates. My name is Tim Allen and I'm the director of the Viroz Lauji Center of Africa. And we're very excited to be working with Moving Back on, on this event. Move Me Back is a community of professionals making Africa's most exciting and unique opportunities accessible and realizable to top talent, leaders, influencers, and organizations. The Firoz Lauji Center for Africa has been lucky to engage with Move Me Back for several years as they have participated in our career fair for our um, world, world renowned Africa Summit, annual Africa Summit. Um, and they have, supported many, they have supported many LSE African graduates on their career journey. As part of the Feroz Lounge Center for Africa Talks, um, Africa Talks series, this event marks the announcement of the Africa Engagement Program Careers Transition Lab, or the AEP Careers Transition Lab. The purpose of the AEP Careers Transition Lab is to equip LSE graduates with the knowledge skills and tools needed to support their transition from scholarly work at the London School of Economics to professional work pursued on the African continent. The AEP Careers Transition Lab will be a four day lab where 15 to 20 African graduate students will engage in seminar style discussions about topics connected to transitioning work on the African continent after their time at the LSE. It will take place on the 18th through to the 21st of June. So please keep a lookout on the Federal Society Centre for Africa website for more information coming this week. Now, let me turn to this event. This event will be moderated by the very talented and knowledgeable uh, Dr. David Luke. Um, David Luke will soon be joining us here at the LSE as a professor in practice in the Federal Society Centre for Africa and will oversee the new Africa Trade Policy Program that we're initiating. He is currently head of the Africa Trade Policy Center at the UN Economic Commission of Africa with the rank of director at the commission. He's responsible for leading ECA's research, policy, advisory services, training and capacity development on inclusive trade policies and in particular for the boosting of intra-African trade and the continental free trade area initiatives. His portfolio also includes the World Trade Organization, Brexit, Africa's trade with emerging economies, um, and trade and cross-cutting policy areas such as industrialization and structural transformation, gender, public health, uh, and climate change. He looks at how trade relates to all of those um, phenomena. Prior to joining ECA in 2014, he served as UNDP's uh, trade policy advisor in Southern Africa and Geneva, and also as a senior economist and, um, and, and chief of trade at the Organization for African Unity, African Unity Commission, and as an associate professor at Dale House University in Halifax, Canada. We're excited to have him join our team and to have him moderate this event. Please welcome David Luke, who will let you know a little bit more about what's going to happen next. David, over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, uh, for that uh, introduction. And welcome, everyone, to our conversation on the future of work in Africa. As was mentioned, this event is hosted by FLCA, or the Fios Lounge Center for Africa, and Move Me Back. And it's a very important conversation to have us at this time. As is the case almost everywhere, COVID-19 brought an abrupt end to the promising growth trajectory in Africa in the years up to 2019. 
On average, African economies shrunk by 3.2% during 2020, pushing millions back into poverty. There is now an expectation of a return to positive growth rates of up to 4% on average in Africa this year. This assumes, of course, that the pandemic can be contained, including through equitable rollout of vaccines and mutations of the virus do not lead to new spikes. As new conversations are occurring around bouncing back from the pandemic, this is a good time to pause and take stock of the challenges and opportunities facing the continent. Africa is a 1.2 billion person market with a pre-COVID pre 19 continental GDP of 2.5 trillion US dollars. And N an encompassing strategy for responding to the challenge of transforming the structure of African economies and overcoming endemic poverty is unfolding, driven by new possibilities of expanding trade opportunities within and outside the continent. This fundamentally requires deriving greater value from regional and global supply chains. And it is essential if Africa is to be able to respond to the demographic challenge of absorbing its 252 million youth aged between 15 and 24 in productive activities. According to the International Labour Organization, young people, male and female, have been disproportionately, disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 crisis and its multiple shocks, including disruption to education and training, employment and income losses, and greater difficulties in finding a job. At the same time, technology is disrupting the way business is organized and work is carried out, and indeed the way life itself is lived. Solutions are also demanded in a planet that is increasingly being put at risk by unsustainable human economic activity. The measures African governments, businesses, civil society, development partners and stakeholders need to take to address these issues, especially in order to establish pathways for young people into employment and sustainable development in the continent is the topic we're addressing today. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSC COVID-19, as it is part of the LSC shaping the post-COVID world series. In your tweets, please include at Africa at LSC so we can capture the conversation happening on social media. This online event is being recorded and will be made available as a podcast following the event. It is also being live streamed on Facebook. We're joined by four expert panelists who have prepared, who have each prepared a statement on the topic I've just described. I'll share the bios prior to each of their presentations so you can keep these in mind during the talk. This will be followed by a conversation moderated by me. As usual, there'll be a chance for you, the audience, to put questions to each speaker. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature in, at the bottom of your screen, screen in Zoom. For Facebook users, please put your question, question in the comments uh, section. Questions will be submitted to me and I'll pose as many as possible to the speakers. Please let us know your name and affiliation. We are particularly keen to hear from our students, alumni, and incoming students. Our first speaker is Professor Kenneth Ameshi, and um, I'll now introduce uh, Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth joined the University of Edinburgh in 2010 following a career in management consultancy. He held positions at the Cranfield School of Management and the University of Warwick, Warwick Business School and Warwick Manufacturing Group, respectively. He was a Chevening Scholar at, uh, of the International Center for Corporate Social Responsibility at the University of Nottingham and a visiting scholar at the Said Business School, University of Oxford, where he's currently an external examiner. Kenneth's research interests currently focuses on sector level policies for sustainability and sustainability strategy in organizations. He has an expert level knowledge of developing and emerging economies. He has an extensive network in Africa. He was recently a scholar in residence at the National Pension Commission in Nigeria, and is currently a visiting professor of strategy and governance at the Lagos Business School, uh, also in Nigeria. Besides teaching and researching, Kenneth works closely with businesses and governments in Africa, Europe, and Asia. He leads executive capacity building engagements and consultancy projects in the uh, broad areas of sustainable finance, 
sustainable strategy, leadership, ethics, and, and governance. So Kenneth, it's a pleasure to have you and, and you have the floor for your introductory uh, comments and remarks. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. And good afternoon, uh, the audience. And also thank you, um, LSE, for inviting me to participate um, in this uh, webinar. Um, what I want to talk about um, is just for five minutes, really, um, to focus on the future of work in Africa. But I thought before we went into the main conversation, it would be nice to situate work because work in itself is contextual. Um, so the future of work in Africa would need to be situated within the African context. And in order to start the conversation, I have a series of questions more like to pose as, as I go through. So the first point there is that given that work occurs in society, it would be nice for us to start with the sort of society we want in Africa. So the AU 2063 has given a vision, but how would that, what, what sort of society do we want in that? So what sort of societies do Africans want? So Africa is not a monolithic um, continent. Um, there are different countries within Africa, different nations. Um, we need to start with this broad question of the type of societies we want, and these societies would then help us shape and determine what the future of work would look like within that context. In addition to the society, we also need to think about the economy, um, whether we're looking at the formal economy or the informal economy or whatever economy we, we want to have in, in mind. Uh, work also is something that is part and parcel of the economic agenda and economic development. So in addition to asking the question of what sort of societies do we want in Africa, there is also the question of what sort of economies do we want in, uh, in Africa? So what type of economies would work for Africa also is, is a good question to ask because um, the economy society conversation has largely been dominated by maybe um, the global north um, and most of the things that happen in Africa in terms of business society relationship um, tends to be informed and shaped by that conversation. But I'm thinking that there, needs, there is need for an indigenous and local way of thinking about business society relationship on one hand and also economy and society, because it's within this context that the nature of work can be further appreciated on the continent. But tied to the kind of society we want and the type of economies we want is the issue of governance. And this governance here is broadly um, articulated because it might relate to the kind of politics we want, the kind of democracy we want, the kind of political system we want, the kind of regulations we want. And when you come to that space of regulation, you're also looking at both um, what I may call as safe regulation and the hard regulation. So because work in itself is, you know, requires to, to be uh, situated within that conversation of the type of governance, um, what sort of work do we need? Uh, how should work be paid for? Who should pay for what? What sort of work should be allowed? What sort of work um, would need to support the kind of societies we want to um, create in Africa? So I think it's, it's very important to think about um, what are good ways of governing societies and economies in Africa? Because work in itself needs to be governed. A classic example would be the case of um, what you may call a just wage or responsible employment. What would it look like in practice? Think about what is happening in multinationals and their supply chains where some people are marginalized uh, along the line. Think about issues of fair trade. These are conversations that shouldn't be left to the market alone. Uh, as much as you want multinationals and companies to be socially responsible in their employment practices, you also want to make sure that the hard regulation is there to help uh, ensure that we have the kind of uh, society and economies we want. But can governments or NGOs or businesses do it alone? Probably not. So that's where collaboration comes in. And here I'm thinking about uh, a collaborative capitalism of some sort that would require um, different actors coming together to shape uh, and discuss this nature of work in Africa. So for me, the key question there will be, what roles can collaboration play in the achievement of the Africa we want? And it's within this, co this context that we can also think about work. 
because work shouldn't be looked in isolation. And, and then the future of work in Africa, to a large extent, in my opinion, will be informed by the type of societies we want in Africa, the type of economies we want to work for Africa, and also the governance in, in place, whether you're looking at the, the political system, governance system, or self-regulation. Um, but ultimately, I see a role for collaboration uh, across the different actors that would make uh, work meaningful and, and uh, helpful within the African context uh, going forward. So I'll stop here and uh, expect to have further conversations when we go to that session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth, uh, for um, giving us this uh, framework uh, to think about the issues um, on the future of, of work. Essentially, you're telling us um, also that um, uh, within this framework, policy choices have to be made as to um, what work um, would entail, what work would be available, and um, uh, how to take uh, these um, sorts of issues uh, uh, forward. So um, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Our next uh, uh, speaker uh, would be uh, Kojo Boache. Uh, Kojo uh, Boache um, is, uh, just um, let me, sorry. Uh, yeah, Kojo Boache is Facebook's uh, Director of Public Policy for Africa. He's an ICT for development practitioner with 17 plus years working with governments, fixed line and mobile operators, uh, development partners, online service providers, content developers, entrepreneurs, and civil society organizations. Prior to joining Facebook, he was the deputy executive director of the World Wide Web Foundation's uh, Alliance for Affordable Internet, or A4AI, and he previously headed research and consultancy at the Commonwealth Te telecommunications organization. Before being asked to lead Facebook's policy work in Africa, uh, Kojo's work focused on broadband affordability, connectivity, and access, with a special focus on the socioeconomic impact of broadband services. Today, his work involves the full gamut of policy matters that impact the digital economy, including data privacy, content policy, taxation, cybersecurity, election integrity, online safety, digital literacy, digital payments, and entrepreneurship. Kojo continues to be passionate about creating opportunities for Africa and Africans, and most recently joined the board for Junior Achievement Africa. Uh, 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 recently joined the board for Junior Achievement Africa. In addition to an MSc in Development Studies, Kojo holds a BA in African History and Development Studies from the School of Oriental and African uh, Studies. Uh, so Kojo, uh, you have the floor. Thanks ever so much, David, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the audience. Um, about four and a half years ago, I spoke at a session looking at the future of work. And the scenarios we spoke of, many of which were scary, felt around a decade away. I left that meeting feeling quite pessimistic about what the fourth industrial revolution or the third industrial revolution, depending on what theory you subscribe to, had in store for us. I understood hundreds of millions of jobs would disappear, automation would favor bigger companies, and more formal economies would be better prepared to navigate what were going to be choppy waters. Moreover, Africa, due to its lack of infrastructure, labor intensive practices, uh, challenged education systems, and a low resistance to shocks would be worst hit. Moreover, although some SSA governments and international partners that I was working with were thinking about the future of work, there were more pressing near-term challenges that were being prioritized. One could be forgiven for feeling more pessimistic today. We remain in the midst of a pandemic that has accelerated our shift towards the fourth industrial revolution that we're seemingly unprepared for. While vaccine rollout is proceeding slowest in Africa and a big shout out to the people working on the, the COVAX vaccine rollout at the moment. 
At the same time, the economic impact of COVID is said to be felt most in SSA, which had some of the fastest growing economies in the world prior to the pandemic. And you can look at places like Ghana and Rwanda and South Sudan for evidence of that. That pessimism could have been compounded even further when reviewing some of the questions myself and my esteemed fellow panelists were sent in preparation for this session, things to think about. And one of those jumped out at me, what challenges will Africa, African countries face in the coming um, decade? Growing youth populations, growing unemployment and growing inequality. And how will it deal with those? To me, this read like a deterministic doomsday scenario, pop growth, unemployment and growing inequality. Yet I'm not pessimistic and in part that's because of an unshakable belief that I and my colleagues at Facebook have in Africa's future, but also an understanding that necessity is the mother of invention most of the time. And because of the changes that we see on the continent every day due to some of the work that we do and the work of others, it's not written in stone that unemployment and inequality will grow in the long term. And if you're Japanese, Italian, Finnish or Portuguese, where aging populations are a significant challenge, you're unlikely to view Africa's population, which will make up 25% of the world's most digitally active people by 2020, 20, by 2025 as a disadvantage. At Facebook, we see the future as a challenge that needs to be navigated in SSA, just like it is elsewhere, but one that Africa may be uniquely positioned to take on. We're not alone, thankfully. A report by the World Bank that looks at the future of work in Africa, one of few that takes a really deep look at some of the reasons why, uh, outlines some of the reasons why the shocks posed by automation may not hit Africa as hard as it does in other regions. Projections that 40 to 60% of manufacturing jobs that will, uh, will be lost are less worrying to Africa and Africans where manufacturing only accounts for 8% of GDP at the moment, then they might be elsewhere. Sad to say, but very true. Case studies that look at the impact of tech on jobs as well, this idea that tech will wipe out jobs doesn't always stand up, but actually they highlight how tech increases or can increase the number of jobs. In PESA, a well-documented example of money transfer and bringing the unbanked into the bank banking sector is, out, is said to have um, uh, decreased the number of people working in banks in Kenya uh, by 6,000 between 2014 and 2017, and, and may be cited as an example of how tech makes some jobs obsolete. But that argument wouldn't stand up when one, when one realizes that the number of mobile agents dealing with M-Pesa payments actually increased by more than 70,000, highlighting a direct positive impact of tech on jobs. And those of us who use tech every day and work on the continent realize the impact that even the most basic of apps, even the, the use of voice can have on the lives and livelihoods of those who are illiterate for whatever reason. What more tech that brings and gives them video uh, like YouTube? How many of us learn from YouTube? At the, same, at the same time, where tech, most notably broadband, is implemented, it creates opportunity. The World Bank notes that the arrival of faster internet in sub-Saharan Africa during the 2000s and early 2010s increased the probability that one would find employment by 3.1%. Last year, Facebook commissioned its own research looking at the socioeconomic impact of, of submarine cable landings in six countries, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Kenya, South Africa, Mozambique and Tanzania, and it found the same thing, that actually the likelihood of employment increased. In Nigeria, it increased by 7.8%. In Tanzania, a whopping 18.7%. And Kenya also saw an increase, but actually, interestingly, Kenya saw how the, the uh, arrival of those cables for people in those connected areas actually saw them transition in a process of social mobility that saw them move from low skilled work to higher skilled work. So I'm positive and some people will think everything's all done. So there's nothing to worry about. Bring the internet, bring tech and there'll be enough jobs for everyone. And my answer to that is, well, no. Obviously policy interventions, some of those mentioned by uh, Kenneth in the previous uh, intervention 
are going to be super important. The World Bank talks about the need for affordable access for all policies that drive entrepreneurship and importantly, safety nets that will enable entrepreneurs to take more risks, but also for those who can't seize opportunities for whatever reason to not be left behind. All of these will be positive interventions. At the same time, the bank highlights what it has since its report in 2016, something I played a hand in helping uh, socialize throughout Africa um, when I was part of the Alliance for Affordable Internet, something called the analog complements. These are the policies, regulations, levels of competition, capital uh, in terms of finance, but also human capital that make tech work. We see great evidence of this. And David, I know you'll be playing a big part in how the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement actually brings the benefits that so many of us are excited about. Those analog complements are being put in place. And in Facebook, we're doing our bit to make sure that all the elements of this are in place. We work, as my team does, with civil society organizations, academics and governments across the region on policy development in some of the most cutting edge areas, including uh, taxation and privacy or cybersecurity. But at the same time, we're investing. We're investing in the connectivity that will enable the many young people who will seek opportunity moving forward to connect. Our investment in the Two Africa cable, more than 37 kilometers of submarine cable that will for the first time connect east to West Africa or West to East Africa via South Africa uh, will be, in our view, will revolutionize, could, with those analog complements and the right policies in place, revolutionize the continent, bring in 10 times more broadband capacity than is currently there and enabling many of the mobile operators with some of those that we've partnered with, including MTN and Airtel, to expand uh, 4 and 5G that's so important to the digital economy. Our fiber investments in places like Uganda, Nigeria, and DRC, in some of the regions that are unconnected for the time being, are also helping to bring the digital economy and its benefits and the opportunities it presents to millions of African people. And we hope we'll be able to do much, much more. But it's not just about the tech, David, it's about ensuring that people can use that productively. And when you look at the investments that we've made, more than 100,000 young entrepreneurs with a special focus on the young and women who are often left behind. We're ensuring that we're creating jobs and employment for those entrepreneurs, but giving them the skills to create jobs and employment for others. Our boost with Facebook program, She Means Business or Digify Pro, which I encourage you all to read about, are all examples of this. And at the same time, our investment in actual physical presence. In the, late, in the latter half of this year, we will open our second office in the Africa region in Nigeria, which we're incredibly excited about, and we hope that many of the listeners are. And importantly, this will house policy. Members of my team will be there, and I will spend lots of time there, God willing. But also uh, sales, and importantly, engineering from our new uh, product experimentation team. And they have a mission which is to create a talent hub, hiring the very, very best Africans to work on products that are for Africa first and foremost, but that we're confident will be products for the world. And for us, that's a key signal of intent that's required at this time. David, you may sit and ask, and many audience may ask, Koja, why are you so positive? We know, as is written in the blurb for this session, that we're gonna need 18 million jobs a year and we're only, we're only creating 3 million at this moment. That positivity stems from the investments we make in and the way, and, and the, in my view, the inherent um, ingenuity and drive of Africans. But it is tempered a bit. It's tempered by the fact that actually there are policies and measures being taken on the continent that might undermine our efforts at driving a digital economy. Internet shutdowns in places like Cameroon or Chad that last hundreds of days, or Uganda, which currently stops people from uh, using Facebook unless you have a UPN, uh, VPN. Uh, digit data localization policies where, where, where policymakers assume proximity to data 
will drive security of data has or runs the risk of undermining our efforts at driving a digital economy or inappropriate taxation, which is a pertinent question for everyone, including Facebook, but where inappropriate taxation undermines the work of entrepreneurs who might create jobs, stops people using the tech and internet that will create opportunity and enable them to take it, but also completely undermines, in our view, the future that governments are trying to create. There is a final piece that's necessary, and I know my time is up, David, and that's the hope of youth. And we know as we, walk, we, we, we travel and work around the continent that actually this is probably the most important thing that we need to generate. There are millions, hundreds of millions of young Africans, many who are supremely educated, who come out and don't find work, who question, uh, in some cases, their governments and question what future they have. And installing hope, through taking the right measures is key to us. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kojo, for um, uh, this intervention. I think you have shared with us, uh, you know, firstly, um, uh, most importantly, perhaps that uh, Facebook is uh, supremely confident in Africa's uh, uh, future and is backing this uh, with its investments, including um, the investment in cable connectivity uh, uh, Etc. But you've also shared with us um, uh, some important insights that uh, complement what uh, the, the framework that uh, Kenneth gave us to think about these issues, and that is that um, uh, policy choices are, are important. And uh, as you say, um, uh, you know, whilst indeed the technology is a disruptor, it um, also can uh, generate jobs. You know, so it's not uh, automation does not. Uh, um, take away uh, jobs as, as such, we have to see the net effect. And um, you've also said that um, uh, a number of analog, uh, as you put it, policies uh, are required to, to drive this uh, adaptation to the digital world in, in, in which we live. Um, and uh, you've also warned about uh, policies or wrong policy choices uh, that can um, undermine uh, this uh, uh, trajectory. Uh, you talked about the internet shutdown, uh, taxation policies that uh, may not be appropriate, uh, etc. All of this, of course, is uh, is uh, is up for debate, and I'm sure that there would be um, interventions from uh, the audience uh, on these uh, uh, issues. But now let me turn to Oi um, uh, Solebo, who would be our next speaker. Uh, Oi is uh, the co-founder of the organization Move Me Back. Uh, Move Me Back aspires to drive positive economic and social growth in Africa by providing an internationally trusted platform through which individuals, organizations, and institutions across the world interact and partner with Africa. They are making Africa's most exciting and unique opportunities available to talented professionals, students, leaders, and influencers, whilst providing a platform to empower and enable these individuals to contribute to Africa's economic and social growth and development story. This work has given the opportunity to many Africans in the diaspora to return to their home countries and contribute to work being done on the ground. Oin was previously an investment associate at Goldman Sachs and a strategic consultant for Roland Berger's Sub-Saharan African Financial Services uh, team. Oi, you now have the floor. Over to you. Thank you very much, David. Okay. Um, so I'd like to share my perspective or our perspective from moving back on what the future of work in Africa means for talent, be you an employee, an employer or a sole entrepreneur. And these insights are garnered from years of working with over 500 organizations and a community, a curated African community of over 50,000 people in over 170 countries and observing how the world of work is, is changing for them. Now, one estimate has already been given about Africa needing to create 18 million jobs per year. There is one, there are some estimates that actually amount this to 500 million jobs needing to be created by 2035. And that's when you look at new entrants into the labor market, as well as the transition from informal unstable jobs to formal jobs. And with this in mind, at Move Me Back, we've established 10 long-term enablers or themes that are driving the creation of 500 million jobs in light of the future of work, the demographic and the technological changes that we're observing. 
Um, we don't have time to go through all of them, but I want to highlight a few of them. And we, we label them the Continent 500 Transformation Goals. The first one I'll highlight is high value skills development and talent repatriation, um, which is bringing huge potential for the future of work. As well as Africa being home to the world's youngest population, there's already a, a shortage, a well-documented shortage of skills, with places like Ghana having only 50% of their tertiary educated living in country. But technology perhaps means that you don't necessarily need to be in Africa to be working in Africa. The second area I'll highlight and say very briefly, because, because David can tell us a lot more about this, is intercontinental connect connectivity, collaboration and trade. And the fact that AFTA launched earlier this year is connecting Africa's 1.3 billion people. The removal of trade barriers and the allowing of free movement of goods, services and people across the continent have huge implications for the future of work. The next area I'll highlight is access to financial services and products. With 66% of Africans still being unbanked, the majority of us are still unable to access essential products that are needed to drive economic activity and development and therefore the future of work. One that we don't speak about enough, I think, is exporting culture and identity. So the creative cultural and tourism industries have the potential to not only enable Africa to reclaim its narrative, but also to create a significant amount of jobs, economic growth um, through, through the likes of exportation of our culture. The African Union, in fact, has been 2021 the year of arts, culture and heritage. And with the continent only contributing 1% of the world's creative market, there are huge opportunities. And you only need to look at the likes of Apple, TikTok, Netflix, doing more on the African continent to see where the potential lies. Scalable energy access is another big theme for the future of work that we're seeing, where with only two out of three people in Africa, uh, sorry, two out of three people in Africa having no access to energy, in addition to climate change, expected to reduce GDP by 15% in Africa by 2030, there are huge implications for the future of work. And the last one I will highlight is homegrown digital infrastructure and platforms, uh, which I think Kojo could tell us a lot more about as well. With only 25% of Africans online, increased and scalable connectivity solutions will be a key driver to new innovation and new work. So what does all of this mean for talent? Well, first of all, with respect to the kinds of organisations that we'll likely be working for or leading, we're seeing a number of cultural shifts happening. Other than the obvious shift and focus on technology, we're also seeing organisations becoming more adaptive rather than responsive to change as a necessity not only to survive, but also to thrive in a very rapidly changing world. We're seeing organizations becoming a lot more purpose driven and actually hiring for people who are aligned to their purpose. They focus not what on they're doing, but on why they're doing it as a way of staying on course in a very fast changing environment. We're seeing organizations becoming agile problem solvers and problem solving skills is probably the number one skill that we're seeing employers asking us for um, in this transition in, in the future of work. We're seeing that the, the, the world, world of work is becoming one of continuous learning. So regardless of your seniority, regardless of your age, one should expect to continuously be brushing up on their skills as they continue through the world of work. Um, teams are becoming increasingly more remote and distributed with coordinated oversight. This was happening pre-COVID, but obviously COVID has sped this up. Um, and this actually may be something that is good for those of us that want to work on Africa or with Africa, but may not be ready to physically move back. Um, obviously aligned to this, we're seeing increased communicate, uh, continuous real-time communications and the need of internet connectivity to really support that. And we're also seeing organizations have an increased focus on the psychological well-being of their staff. What does this mean for the industries of focus for the future? These very much align with the transformation themes that I spoke about earlier, but they also align to where we're seeing a lot of capital being flown into the African continent. Obviously last year was a big year for FinTech on the African continent and continues to be. This month alone, we've already seen Flutterwave become Africa's fourth unicorn after Interswitch and Ferrari, another two FinTech companies and Jumia. So continued opportunities in that sector. 
clean tech continue, will continue to be a, a big sector of interest as well, and did receive almost a quarter of funding last year. Um, we're seeing fintech as an opportunity or another opportunity for the continent to leapfrog the West, similar to the way that um, digital payments did. If you just look at Kenya as an example, Kenya is already 90% reliant on renewable energy, and they are leapfrogging the world in electric transportation by building charging stations across Nairobi before expanding to the rest of, uh, rest of Kenya, something that the West is still struggling with. Analytics and data. Now, this only received 7% of um, funding last year, but it's going to be an area of increasing importance. Why? Well, because with the rise of internet penetration and the adoption of cloud services by companies, localized storage is going to become increasingly important for Africa's infrastructure. So although the continent only accounts for 1% of global uh, data centers at the moment. We're expect there are some estimates that expect that to rise by 12% year on year. So these don't negate all the other areas of interest, but these are certainly areas which I would uh, pay close attention to in the future. Thirdly, what does it mean for skills? Well, we're seeing organizations increasingly more focused on hiring for behavioral skills rather than just technical and core competencies. So organizations are looking to hire people based on their ability to problem solve, their self-management skills, their ability to work with people, not necessarily just focusing on technical and core competencies that they once did. And these are things that very much link to the future of work and the dynamics of constant change. They aren't necessarily things you can learn in a textbook, but certainly through everyday behavior, um, we can all uh, adapt to. And lastly, what does it mean for entrepreneurship? Well, we think that it's going to mean actually that everyone needs to consider themselves as an entrepreneur. Um, yes, we're seeing entrepreneurship becoming a more stable career path on the African continent with organizations that are expanding into new regions or expanding their business models, looking for entrepreneurs to join their team. And yes, we're seeing an increase in entrepreneurship accelerators on the continent. But we're also seeing organizations hiring for an entrepreneurial mindset. Why is this? Well, employees need to be more adaptive problem solvers to, to succeed in this future of work. Um, I think my time's up, so I'll leave it there. But I would encourage anyone who wants to learn more about some of these insights that we've shared to please go to movingback.com forward slash pulse and sign up to our newsletter on some of these themes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Oi. And um, again, just um, you know, three or four things uh, jumped at me, uh, and very quickly, uh, you know, suddenly um, uh, spelling out for us uh, what uh, uh, Kojo referred to as the analog uh, type of policies that are going to be required uh, to support uh, the growth of of work and employment on 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 the continent to meet the challenges you talked about. Um, uh, TED, of course, uh, was one of those um, uh, policy areas, uh, but also you talked about access to financial services, you talked about new opportunities that uh, untapped, uh, including um, uh, the cultural uh, sector. But um, a second area that you highlighted is the way work is changing and um, uh, the way work is being uh, managed uh, with some insights on the kinds of um, problem solving skills, uh, continuous learning, uh, psychological well-being, self-management, uh, clean technology, uh, uh, and, 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 and so on. And then um, uh, ending with um, the emphasis you're putting on entrepreneurship, that this is no longer a specialized activity, but it's the business, uh, so to say, of, um, of uh, uh, everyone. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for these insights. Again, complementing the kind of framework that uh, Kenneth uh, laid out and uh, the policy choices, that none of all of this is going to be automatic. Policy choices have to be made, and uh, I think we're uh, all moving uh, in the same direction on, on these issues. Now, let me turn to uh, Shami Surya Naren, uh, who uh, would be our final uh, speaker. Uh, Shami serves as Chief Impact Officer for Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator in South Africa. Uh, Shami is a fierce advocate for opportunity and social justice for young people and women across the African continent. Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator develops African solutions for the global challenge of youth unemployment. Uh, Shami leads on Harambi's impact and systems uh, change agendas and also oversees Harambi's work in new markets. 
Shami brings extensive experience in human capital management, education, and facilitating links to employment across Africa, India, and the United States. Uh, she served as vice president of lifelong engagement uh, at um, uh, African Leadership Academy, uh, where she oversaw a network of 2,000 young African leaders, managed uh, ALAs, uh, that's the African Leadership Academy, uh, uh, ALAs uh, Ma MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program. Uh, she has also been involved with the Africa Careers Network uh, of ALA and ALA's alumni engagement uh, team. Uh, Shami is an Aspen Africa Leadership Initiative Fellow of the class of 2020 and sits on the boards of emerging public leaders on Goza, Metis, Instill Education, and is on the advisory council for the Next Gen Ecosystem Builders Africa 2020. Shami holds a BA uh, from Harvard University, a master's degree from the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education, and another master's degree from Northwestern's University's Kellogg School of Management. Uh, Shami, it's a delight to have you on the panel, and uh, please um, make your presentation. Thank you so much, David. It's an honor to be with you all, and um, thank you for bearing with me. I had a couple of tech difficulties, so again, I thank you for projecting my slides. I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of Harambe, um, just to, to let you know, Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator is based in South Africa and in Rwanda, although I'm dialing in from Nairobi, and it's a delight to, to join you today. Um, we are an African solution to the global challenge of youth unemployment. We pathway young people to work by creating more opportunities, reducing barriers for young people to access work, and importantly, linking them to work at scale. Since we started in 2011, we've pathwayed more than 240,000 young people to work and have a network of 1.2 million young people. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about three main points. So it kind of, you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, and my first point is, you know, kind of hints a little bit at what um, Kojo was talking about a little bit, which is grounded optimism. Um, and the point I'd like to make here is that we need a mindset shift. We need a mindset shift in terms of the future of work in Africa, which is one that moves away from automation killing jobs to one that suggests that automation means more and different work. So there's a lot of doomsday prophecies for the future of work. I mean, Kojo talked a little bit about this in terms of the number of jobs that will be affected by automation, um, joblessness, et cetera, in, in, in Africa. But, and some jobs will be more vulnerable than others, but I do share his, his optimism and I'll share um, specifically why. Um, because, you know, we as humans, we're wired to think of the negative and to anchor on the lost um, in, instead of sort of focusing on positivity, optimism and abundance. After all, who wouldn't, right, with the year that we've had and the pandemic that has wrought destruction across many parts of the world. You know, our politicians spend a lot of time upon the elimination of jobs, and this fuels a dangerous conversation, which suggests that robots are the enemy, or worse, foreign labor is the enemy, and cheap labor is the enemy. So instead of just focusing on that, and without question, we have to engineer solutions for social protection and make sure that there's decent jobs and reskilling happens, et cetera. But I think we fundamentally fail to plan for the future, both for reskilling, but importantly for new jobs on the horizon. And for me, I think our governments and our institutions need to move beyond a zero sum approach um, and instead focus on creating new jobs very actively. The work for the planning of the future of work is to keep a foot in the present, but keep an eye on the future while focusing on what we have in abundance. And that is human skill and ability. So let me share some evidence. With the COVID crisis, everyone is justifiably very concerned about job losses across the African continent with strict lockdowns in almost every country um, and many deaths. Despite this, in South Africa, where Harambe operates, one sector, the business process outsourcing sector, grew. It sustained almost a 30% growth rate, which has been carried over for the past few years. And this was a result of new jobs, not just displacement and business continuity planning, which is moving jobs from one area to another to protect exposure. For example, more remote work, I mean, we're all on a, a Zoom conference right now, more remote work has meant more need for technological support. A lot of that work did come to the African continent um, in, with increasing pressures, for example, that Facebook faces on regulation. There's a greater need for content moderators, and that work has started to come to Africa as well. 
in South Africa alone, Harambe found that close to 6,000 new jobs um, were created in the, in the last quarter alone. And this for us is, is an indication that these are decent jobs, they're well-paying jobs, and they're quality jobs. And we do believe that it's important to actually anchor on these opportunities rather than necessarily focusing just on the areas where, where jobs are lost. Um, importantly, this is only possible because governments, industry, and social enterprises coordinated a plan of action together to focus on job creation for specific sectors. So that's my first point, which is about grounded optimism and that automation could mean more and different work. My second point is that skilling for work needs to be shorter but learning needs to be lifelong. And this point for me is about duality and really showing that there's two sort of contradictory but really complementary points that, that we need to, to, to think about if we need to reimagine our institutions. What does this mean? So if you think about it, the linear path that may have worked for you and me and many of us on this panel, from school to university to work, is just no longer work. It's fundamentally shifted for millions across the world and definitely in Africa. Our universities were kind of hardwired for the industrial era of work. And we, we need to shift it. We need to fundamentally reimagine what the concept of training and skilling is. And instead of valuing training and skilling for its length, we actually need to value it for what it does in terms of accessing the labor market. So what does this really mean? Let me share some evidence. Again, with Harambe, we, um, we found that shorter skilling for work, Harambe found that Working with over 500 employers, we were able to, within five weeks, get a young person short, quick, sharp access to a job. Um, and we were able to beat industry norms in terms of performance, attrition, retention, et cetera, by focusing on what really counts for the job. And I don't mean that learning and education at a university is irrelevant. For me, I think it's important for us to hold these two parallel arcs together. So there's two arcs. We need skilling institutions, governments and institutions to really think about the short arc, which is that of skilling for work. It has to be the shortest pathway for a young person to get access to a job, to get money in their pockets, money that they can't spend anywhere else, um, and get them started earning and getting them the experience that they so desperately need to get a foot, foothold into the labor market. And the second longer arc, which is really a never ending arc, which is of lifelong learning, reskilling, really thinking about the new jobs that keep coming into our horizon, since all of our jobs are going to be affected by automation anyway. So for us to actually think of how do people move in and out of work, constantly build, iterate their skills, and map an overall employment journey. It's what we as, as Harambe call pathway management, which is really creating on-ramps and off-ramps to learning and earning, to allow people to learn while work and try to get back to work. I mean, we've seen this and um, we haven't really chatted about this as, as a panel, but the COVID crisis really impacted gender and women in particular. And women have been greatly affected and many of them have actually left the work. So get, creating on-ramps for women to return to work and shorter skilling pathways to enable young women to particularly access work in this time is actually really critical to get back on track in terms of our gender goals. So that's my, my second point. And then my last point, um, is really a truism that everyone's probably going to roll their eyes about, but the future is digital. And before you, you sort of roll your eyes, you know, everyone knows that the future is, is digital. The future of work, just like in every other part of the world, is digital. But it's almost unhelpful to say this. For me, there's the third point for me is about specificity. What do we even mean by digital, right? So I feel like it means very different things to very different people. If you walk on the streets of Nairobi, it's going to mean a very different thing to a junior delivery person. For them, it means getting access to contract work on their smartphone. For the developers of Flutterwave, it's about securing a $180 billion deal to, to develop solutions that allow for seamless payments across the African continent. If you ask your colleagues, your friends, they will say different things. It looks like we have lost... Oh, yeah. We have a okay. really strong really, really broken digital jobs in, in Africa, like both boys study um, last year. They found that the um, AWS, cloud computing, et cetera, and what young people were skilling towards. Young people don't know how to skill themselves and prepare for this digital future. 
we believe that many of the digitally outsourced jobs coming to Africa rely on not just the digital skill, but, and here's a provocation, the human factor. Some people need an empathetic human on the phone, someone who demonstrates resilience and an ability to react in addition to being able to respond to a call and resolve a problem. So I personally share Kojo's optimism about Africa as well, with its youth advantage full of digital natives, high levels of motivation, high levels of empathy, tenacity, problem solving and skill. Africa could be a backbone to target coordinated investment that our people are the single biggest natural resources. Um, I think uh, we lost, I think we lost uh, uh, Shami. Um, Shami, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, could you perhaps um, just wrap up on your third point? Um, I think we lost you a bit. So my last point was just to say that digital jobs, we need to really understand and simplify and clarify what they really mean. And that um, th the only provocation that I have is that we have a, an abundant continent with young people in high supply, with high empathy, high motivation, problem solving ability. So I do think that they can play a huge role in the digital economy of the future, because sometimes um, we do need to see some of our um, a burden as a dividend instead. Yeah, great. No, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, drawing upon the, your experience very clearly uh, working at uh, uh, Harambe and um, making a similar point to Oi and uh, Kojo that um, uh, digitalization autom automation, um, we need to look at its overall uh, effects um, on, on jobs, uh, that uh, it's disruptive, it's destructive, but it's also creative um, uh, in, in, in terms of jobs. Uh, and then secondly, um, uh, again, looking at the uh, COVID uh, crisis, making a very important point that um, we have seen uh, job growth, especially in the technology uh, sector uh, during um, uh, the crisis. And, and I've also seen um, other surveys of, uh, of businesses uh, that operate on the continent that um, uh, is leading to the view that uh, digitalization has advanced by as much as uh, perhaps uh, five years uh, during uh, the um, uh, during 2020. And then, of course, uh, your last point um, uh, that uh, we need to uh, build upon the digital natives. I, I think I quite like that uh, expression um, that the future is digital and there is uh, 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 there is a considerable pool of young people uh, that are trainable and, and so on. And that of course also goes with your point about uh, uh, that uh, skilling uh, is something that's uh, continuous, it's lifelong. And uh, uh, the challenge is not just to, in, in, to individuals but also to the institutions that provide education learning to adapt to this uh, new uh, environment. So there you have it. I think um, uh, we have had uh, these uh, four, I think, um, very uh, interesting and, and profound uh, perspectives on, uh, on, on the future of work in, in, in Africa. And um, now I'd like to uh, pose one question to each of you, the same question, and um, just to get your take, uh, and uh, please to limit you to uh, just a minute uh, in answering the question so we could uh, get to the, um, uh, the, the questions that uh, the audience have already sent in. So the question I'd like to ask you is, is as follows. What role does the informal e economy play when discussing youth employment or the future of African work? And Kenneth, could we start with you? Yes, I think it's a very good question. And, and when we talk about informality, then for me, it's a question of whose informality, who defines that? And we tend to characterize anything that doesn't fit into what you may consider the Western model of capitalism we have inherited in Africa as informal, right? So, but if we think about work in terms of what people do to, to um, contribute to their well being, uh, what people do to remain productive, um, then I would want to see it more from a broad perspective. 
And there is also the notion that entrepreneurship needs to be uh, questioned. Um, entrepreneurship is not just about when you set up a big business and, and become a multinational. There is also a space for different forms of organizing. So it's going back to the notion of uh, economic coordination, which um, has been there for a long time. So and people have ways of organizing themselves. And what you may consider informal might not necessarily be informal in that nature, because if you go to rural areas, people still operate. But I'm not saying that we need to go back and the whole of Africa you know, becomes that kind of agrarian society. But I think there is a question there to say, well, how do we, um, or how do we ensure that no one is left behind? And if we are going into a, a much more structured work environment, then uh, we need to think about everyone and it has to be as inclusive as possible. So I would like to see a situation whereby the, the gap between the formal and informal is, is, is um, you know, it's narrow to a large extent, and we begin to think about work in a holistic sense. So the the, the grandmother who sits at home or the mother who sits at home to take care of uh, children, is that person engaging in any productive work? Because sometimes we talk about work in such a way that, um, think of a situation whereby two parents are working in a bank and, and they go to work very early in the morning, come back very late, and the children are taken care of by nannies. And eventually we start thinking, oh, society is changing, the children are not behaving as they ought to behave and, and so on and so forth. But when one parent decides to stay at home and do work, who pays for that? Is that meaningful work? Is that contribution to society? Is that the informal economy? What is it actually? And that's why I go back again to what sort of society do we want? Because that would now determine the type of work and economy that will support that idea. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Kenneth. Um, uh, think about work in a holistic way. Uh, Kojo, um, the same question to you. Uh, what role does the informal economy play when discussing youth unemployment or the future of African work? For the 200 people on the call, it always helps if you unmute. Um, I was going to say, David, are you, you were being unfair on us in asking us to answer that question in, in one minute. I think we, we'd need a day or a separate session just for that. But I think we, we have to acknowledge that the informal sector, if one was to call it that, will continue to be the, the, the host of most people who are employed on the continent. And actually, there are some interesting ideas now. I think much of the talk has been about formalizing the informal. And maybe there's a comfort level that we need to find with actually having the informal and enhancing areas of work within the informal. And I think that's what we that, that's what we need to start thinking about if it's going to continue to do that and to continue to soak up some of the people that need to be employed. At the same time, as we think about this transition from informal to formal, lots of the time it's in it's it's justified in that many governments want to expand the tax base. They want to understand who is who and, and what, what companies are doing, completely justified. But at the same time, there is benefit in perhaps, especially with young tech entrepreneurs who often complain to us that they're taxed too heavily at the start. There's too much regulation upon them at the start to actually get up and get going. Uh, there may be benefit in ensuring that actually they have more space to uh, mature and then transition into the, the formal sector. So acknowledge that it's gonna be the, the, the foremost employer, be comfortable with that, see how we can enhance the work of the informal sector and its ability to create jobs. And don't be too quick, don't be too quick to transition people towards, and companies, sorry, towards a formal sector. If actually there's benefit to the wider economy and, and uh, micro and macro economy of actually having those companies operating where they're operating. Very much, uh, but for that, um, uh, Kojo, don't be too quick in the transition from informal to formal. Very, <laughs> very, very interesting. And indeed, we could spend uh, a month <laughs> discussing these issues. Uh, Oi, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I think the the estimate is something like seventy percent of employment on the continent is is informal. Um, but I think what maybe was being alluded to was was that. There's a question over which jobs are informal and formal, but also a question over which ones are 
where, where people are working to sustain themselves versus working to create value. If people have choice and their choice is to continue working in the formal informal sector, then that is fair enough. But I think where the challenge comes is where young people are entering the workforce and they have no choice but to take unstable jobs and jobs which um, which don't allow them to to have enough of an income to sustain themselves. And what really needs to happen is that there needs to be, I think, as Kojo is aligning to, as far as entrepreneurship is concerned, where entrepreneurship is still seen as an informal sector, there needs to be more support for those who choose are choosing to go into that, not as a way of just being able to feed themselves day by day, but as a way of creating value for the continent. There needs to be more support for that. For those that want to work in the gig economy, there needs to be more support to enable them to do that. And I think Shami gave great examples of this transition for, um, for, for certain tech skills to the African continent with the rise of remote working. The gig economy is still seen very much as an informal sector, but presenting huge opportunities for job and value creation in the continent. And that should still also be, um, uh, I, I think, be something that is that is um, enabled so i think it's not necessarily just a question of formal versus informality but more question of is that informal opportunity allowing someone to both sustain and create value or is it just giving the, them the opportunity to kind of feed themselves day by day yeah okay um again thanks for that uh, whether it's or not it's an opportunity to create a uh, value uh, again very deep uh, insight uh, shami Sure. I mean, Oyin captured it perfectly. For me, I think the, con the contrast is between precariousness and value creation. I think there's a lot of um, informal jobs that are incredibly precarious on the continent. Um, and I think the point is, you know, how do you safeguard those opportunities, those jobs? Um, is it greater social safety nets? Is it access to more jobs, um, even if you are in the informal economy, improving your value chains? Um, allowing you to actually grow your business instead of just being a subsistence um, entrepreneur. And, you know, we as Harambe have, have started to dabble in the informal space in South Africa, and South Africa is famous for being very small in its informal economy in comparison to the rest of the continent. And now it's quickly realizing just with, you know, the lack of formal sector jobs on the horizon, it's having to actually realize that we need a plan for the informal sector in terms of what young people end up doing um, as a side hustle, but trying to ensure that there's some dignity in that, there's social protection in that. And then I think to, to the second point that Oyun was talking about in terms of value, um, this is critical. And I do think that there's a failure in the labor market in terms of valuing informal work. So what are the skills that you actually get from informal? Yeah, great. Okay, thank you also for that, uh, uh, Shami. Uh, with more insights on uh, this um, issue of formality and informality. Um, now, uh, Shami, uh, let me uh, take the first question. Um, There's, and... There are arguably competences. I think it's about you know articulating them and making experience or community experience that or parent. So I think um, what are the skills that you can contribute to the economy and how does that translate into actual skills that are valued? Well. Shami, it's Kojo here. It's such a shame because your intervention about what are the values we thought you, you were just cut off a moment ago and I don't know if there's any value in turning your video off, perhaps for some of your interventions, because they're brilliant and we're just missing out on parts of it. Yeah. So I think the point around connectivity being an enabler in Africa is, <laughs> is an important one and I'm demonstrating it. Um, deliberately deliberately um, uh, I'm demonstrating it. Yeah, um, actually, uh, Shami, um, yes, if, if uh, connectivity and technology could allow, there's a question that's actually directed at you. And uh, it's as follows. How do you define a decent job as Harambi? And how do you measure decency? Yeah, so I think that showcasing and credentials that they do possess, I mean, just to give you a very specific 100,000 COVID um, in the reopening of schools in December, and many of the young people had never worked before, um, but they did have community experience. So that did translate into something for the schools that were interested in hiring them. So while that's a small example, it's about stacking up the skills and competencies, whether they're in the informal sector or the formal sector, and creating value for someone who's a labor market entrant at, at scale. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Um, I'll, uh, I'll direct this question from um, uh, Maya Tulola um, to both um, Oi and uh, Kojo. How can we bridge the gap between labor offer and labor demand, namely between skilled youths and private sector? And what are the most promising economic sectors that can create more jobs in the future? 
Um, perhaps uh, Oyi could go uh, first and, and, and then Kojo. Sure. Um, so the the second question, I believe, was which sectors are most, uh, I think, prevalent for creating jobs? Um, so there are those, I think, that are enabled by technology. And actually, there are those that aren't. So there was some research by McKinsey some years ago about the sectors that can actually create the most jobs. And they were the, actually the labor, uh, the labor intensive sectors. So things like agriculture, manufacturing, um, retail and hospitality, um, according to them, those are actually the ones that can and can, can create the most jobs. Something like agriculture, I think, is something that is overlooked far too much with the amount of arable land on the African continent. A question, again, it's a question of how do you trans, how do you turn that sector around so it's not one of um, uh, subsistence farming, but is one of value creation. And that's going to become increasingly important with Africa being the one of the hardest hit regions with climate change, despite the fact that they haven't contributed the most to, um, to, to emissions. So those sectors are very important. And then I think from a technology perspective, um, it is the ones that we've that I mentioned before. It's things like um, access to financial services. What you notice is that a lot of the tech organizations um, that are doing very, very well, first of all, all of the all of the unicorns are either fintech or fintech enabled. Um, fintech, uh, clean tech, again, very big sector, but again, also connected to fintech. Um, because when you look at things like pay as you go systems for, for soda solutions, you need fintech solutions in order for people to pay as you go. Um, so fintech, clean tech, anything regard, related to data, um, data storage also, I think is going to be um, a very important sector. Yeah. Um, and apologies, I've forgotten the first question. Um, Kojo could take that. Okay. Uh, and that is, um, how can we bridge the gap between labor offer and labor demand, namely between skilled youths and private sector? Kojo? I, if I understand the question correctly, and Oyen made some great interventions on, on the jobs there, so I didn't, I didn't have much to add to that, apart from the fact that I think that, that, that the service sector and sales still remain really, really important. And if you think about the... In, what appears to be the inherent ability of Africans to, 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 to speak two, three, four, five languages at a, at a time, and, and at the same time, our geographical location, it might lend itself to that. When it comes to how we uh, bridge the gap between or, or enable uh, workers to find jobs in the private sector, I think I, think I can speak to how, how, what Facebook is doing in terms of bringing employers and, and people seeking jobs together. And I think there are numerous platforms, not just Facebook jobs that enable uh, people to do that, but there are numerous platforms that are enabling that to happen. We just need to see that increase. And that goes back to, without wanting to sound like a broken record, it goes back to people having opportunity, which is the opportunity to actually be online and to find work where it's available and, to, and enable employers to actually advertise work where it's available too. I hope I've understood the question. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Kojo. Perhaps now I could turn to Kenneth. And Kenneth, there's a question from uh, Shirley oh. Eddy, uh, who is from South Africa, and she's asking, um, she's saying there's much talk of employers seeking behavioral skills in their employees. Are you aware of any recent data to support this trend in, in the African context? Uh, Kenneth? Um, I mean, the idea of behavior, behavioral approach to labor has been there for a long time. I don't think it's something specific to Africa. I know many companies that do uh, kind of psychometrics and using that as a way to decide who they employ or who they don't employ. You know? So, um, the, but I don't have data on that. I don't, I don't know where the data on, on that is actually. Um, but if you permit me to yeah, please go, go back ahead. a bit to, to, to the former question yes. around yeah. um, the kind of um, jobs being created. I, I think one thing also that we need to pay attention to is the the business models, right? So it's not just only about the sectors, but the type of business models that will also unlock opportunities. If you look at your typical FinTech or technology firms, they, they don't tend to create a lot of jobs themselves. They don't employ a lot. They may, they may make a case in terms of how their products or services are creating other jobs. Um, think about Paystack from, from Nigeria, for example, or any of the other ones. You can say, how many jobs do they create directly? There are very few. 
And when somebody talked about automation, yes, automation may need to create a new form, a new, new opportunity, so to speak. So I think, but if you look at a model like the cooperative, the cooperative movement employs more people in the world than your typical businesses, right? Your, your kind of a normal and conventional business model. And Africans are communal in nature. Why wouldn't we encourage cooperatives as a way of creating more jobs and working together and also probably overcome this challenge of formal and informal? Because there we are then speaking to something very close to how we organize. And the other thing is also the view that everyone now needs to be an employer. Sorry, an employee, yeah, an entrepreneur. If you're an entrepreneur, you then need employees. But people can also be prepared to be employees. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and it's, it's, it's the whole notion that we can't all be entrepreneurs. And there is this the, the heroic nature of framing of entrepreneurship as if every, if we are all entrepreneurs, then who will work for us? You know, it doesn't make sense. So I think it's, it's a balance there. We have entrepreneurs, we also have people who uh, are employees and, and then make sure that one is not denigrated because that tends to be the approach these days. So let's talk of entrepreneurship, but then what happens to the other one? So I thought it's good to remember what why to mention the business model and also the type of framing of uh, around entrepreneurship and employ, employee, employees in that sense. No, no thank you, uh, Kenneth, for that. Uh, and of course, uh, one could expect, uh, you know, various perspectives on, on, on these issues. Uh, I have another question, uh, someone um, called Oiti Ajawin, uh, who is asking, how can Africa innovate indigenously, given a lack of uh, coherent uh, intellectual property protection and institutional mechanisms? Is it going to be based on regional dynamics or continental? How does technology diffusion occur given tech competition from China, disrupting not only fintech, the fintech sector, but R&D and investment? Um, anyone on the, uh, on the um, uh, panel who would like to take this question on innovation and competition from China? I can I can I can take a bit of it. And yeah, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can take a touch of it, and then and, and then to the person who was asking for data. I think the question was on what kind of skills employees are looking for now, and asking for specific data. I'd encourage them to read. There was a report by WEF and uh, LinkedIn, I think, in 2017, which you can look at. And then I, I would also encourage you to look at the future of work, a future of work by the World Bank, which again is a, a really in, in infusing report on on on, on tech and innovation. I, I I agree that the challenges posed by um, uh, retaining one's intellectual property are there, but I do think now we have strong examples of African uh, tech entrepreneurs and companies and hubs who are creating technological solutions for the problems they see in the sector. So I, I, I see that as a challenge that one has to be cognizant of and navigate, but I don't see it as insurmountable. With regard to um, Chinese tech disruption, that is the nature of, of ch Chinese tech disruption or any or disruption from anywhere else. That is the nature of, of, of tech. Tech is about disruption. The young entrepreneurs working out of Yaba or uh, in Nairobi or in Accra or in, in, in Cape Town or wherever else. So also in many cases seeking to uh, disrupt. Um, so I think that's part and parcel and lots of people working in tech understand and appreciate that that's something they'll have to work with, although not desirable in every single situation. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and another question, uh, which uh, perhaps um, uh, Shami or um, Oi may want to take, uh, and it's from John Brand. Um, and he's asking, um, can anyone explain how African countries attract capital investment from outside of the continent with central banks in the US and Europe expanding their credit lines to boost post-COVID expansion? Good projects in Africa should be attracting some of this extra funding available for investment if secured on the right terms for the benefits of Africans. So. This is a question on investment, uh, Shami perhaps, and Oin. Sure, I'm turning off my video in the hope that I can be heard. Um, it's yeah. actually a really pertinent question. Um, I was in Rwanda last week um, with uh, my team on the ground, trying to build a business case for the Rwandan government to increase its um, investors in the BPO industry. So part of what Harambe does is to encourage 
um, high growth job sectors to come to African countries. Like we've had great success in South Africa doing that and in Rwanda. And for me, I think it's less about these really large macroeconomic plans and bold ambitions and more about coordinated um, sector driven uh, sort of focused interventions. And it actually takes a lot of work. So between you know having a strategy that the country has in terms of creating 5,000 jobs in ICT, for example, uh, for Rwanda or whatever it is. Um, it is about identifying an investor, building a business case, building the proof point that there's um, an ROI for investors to come into the country, that there are jobs that can be created. So there's, there's a real, there's, there's a piece of hard work that's required to translate plans into action. And that's kind of Harambe's sweet spot, which is not just about designing the plans but ensuring that you know, investment comes in and jobs are on the ground. And I would say that in addition to a lot of these bold macroeconomic plans that many of us are out seeing being written in you know, the post COVID recovery um, scenario, we really need action. We need action at the sort of sectoral level. We need action at a multi-stakeholder level. And we importantly need proof points, not sort of you know, quick iterative pilots that show that you know, these these big plans can actually translate into foreign direct investment on the ground, you know, incentives being designed, for payroll taxes to be recouped by the country, et cetera. So those, those models exist. Um, I think it's, it's very much about translating very ambitious plans into concrete action. And I do think that that's a big gap that we see across the continent. And just one more point is I think the, the AFCTA agreement, the trade agreement couldn't come sooner enough because I think we compete on so many levels, um, you know, we're not a single market, but we're the same. Um, yeah, it looks like we've lost uh, Shami again. David. Yes. size of India. And so I do those inroads quite quickly in Africa and into skills transfer as well. So those are just a couple of points. Yeah. Uh, can, you, oi, oi, can you step in? Yeah, sure. I can step in from, I think Shami covered, um, covered a lot of it, but I'll perhaps focus a little bit more on the, um, on startups from a startup perspective and a scale up perspective. We work with a lot of um, companies across the continent who are, um, who are starting or expanding or scaling across the continent. And whilst they're doing, um, doing amazing things, unfortunately, what we actually see is that and not enough of the funding is going to black founders or going to African founders. So I think there's statistically something like 10% of funding for all African startups go to local funders, uh, sorry, go to local founders. Um, so the reality is that brand awareness of what your startup is, is doing is incredi incredibly important and having a platform for, organized, for, for startups to be able to, who, share the narrative of the impact they're making on the African continent is, is extremely important. Networks are incredibly important. We also find that for a lot of those that are raising money on the continent, they are very well networked, they know each other, it's it's very much a, a, a small community of in, largely actually in many cases an expat community. So um, I think the question is very pertinent because there is indeed a shortage of capital going to local African founders, and that for that brand awareness, um, being able to translate value proposition um, is, is very important for African uh, founders. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, yes, Kojo, please come in. Yeah. Can I just add something that's yes, it's yes. not? Yes, please. Yeah. It's not going to be rocket science to anyone. I think the, the, the thing that helps attract investment is the same as it's always been, which is uh, predictability and, and, uh, uh, steadiness in in policy and environment and I think when you have um, uh, situations like I mentioned before whether it be internet shutdowns or or in some cases and this does not characterize the whole continent but social turmoil in whatever guise it comes in investors look at things like that young entrepreneurs like Oyin is speaking of speaking about also uh, require that predictability in, in order to make investments and work. And that's not rocket science, it's the same as it's always been. Investors like to know the future. Yeah, thanks uh, for that, uh, uh, Kojo. And I'll just add that um, uh, policy reform and policy harmonization on intellectual property rights on investment and indeed also on competition policy uh, is um, uh, part of the next phase of the African continental free trade area negotiations. Uh, so I you think that um, 
we should see some institutional building and some uh, new policy directions in, in these areas. Uh, this is just in response to these um, uh, questions that have uh, been raised. Now we have about uh, just a few minutes left and I'll uh, ask one more question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, and this question is from uh, Maximilian Jarrett and he's asking, he says, energy is key. Uh, what's the panelists' um, perspectives on what is needed now to rapidly scale up power provision and distribution across the continent to drive the new workforce and enable entrepreneurs and business uh, to thrive? Um, anyone on, on um, for two minutes uh, on the, uh, anyone on the panel? This is on energy. I feel like I feel like I'm talking a lot. We we used to, we used to have a team at Facebook that looked at renewable um, energies that was that that was disbanded. But we now have um, for the first time in in our region a director who's focused on sustainability. And it was great to hear from I think it was Shami and Oyen speaking about um, the way Kenya has. I think Oyen mentioned I wasn't. I thought it was eighty, but Oyen, Oyen mentioned ninety percent renewable, which is fantastic. And I, I think it's about understanding that the future is going to be about sustained energy provision and also understanding that most of the things we've spoken about today whether that be entrepreneurship and, and the training of entrepreneurs or building the capacity whether it be tech intervention all of that will rely on ensuring that we have um, the correct energy in place and then developing policies that enable that and whether that means liberalization of existing energy sectors in some countries um uh, time will tell yeah. I think to add to that, I mean, the, the issue of energy, uh, Africa, is where we, Africa is where it is at the moment, and there is a pull to green and all the kind of renewable things. And the question for me is, can Africa make that leap as we have done with uh, mobile technology? And the answer might be no, because of the infrastructure required and the nature of energy. Um, in Europe and North America, they still need energy to warm their homes. Uh, Africa will need, a, uh, Africans will need better quality of life. So as much as possible, we want to remain within what might be optimally acceptable. But I think uh, moving from oil, fossil fuel to gas might be a good um, uh, progress in that uh, transition agenda as opposed to, because even if you go to renewable, the renewable would need to be, go back into the grid system and the infrastructure to distribute it to ensure that no one um, is left behind. And finally, um, as much as we talk about this is, um, David, you talked about government doing things. And what we know in Africa is that many of the governments are not as, as effective as you want them to be. So the question for me is what role can the private sector play? What role can entrepreneurs play within this context that is different from the West? Because we sometimes tend to uh, think about work and business from an ideal scenario of North America, Europe, but this is Africa and we need a different model of thinking about the relationship between entrepreneurs and the state and how development can be pursued despite the challenges the state offers. Yeah, thank you again, uh, Kenneth, for the, these insights. So as we draw to a close, uh, let me ask um, uh, uh, Shami, Oi, and uh, Kojo and Kenneth having just spoken, uh, just um, uh, 30 seconds each, your last uh, uh, parting uh, thoughts. Great, I'll start. Um, I think I'll just ground them in my, the points that I made earlier, which is that of cautious optimism, grounded optimism, um, an ability to actually see the future for what it is, but also plan, um, plan for the future and, and, and be rooted in the present. So um, I do think there's a, a wealth of opportunities coming our way in Africa. And for a young professional considering either coming back or living and working on the continent, I think it's about really look around you and see um, what opportunities you can be a part of, either to be as an entrepreneur or to help build. So for me, it's that of cautious optimism and having a foot in the present and an eye towards the future. Thanks, uh, Shami. Oi, uh, 30 seconds. Thank you. I'm sure that many of the listeners are, you know, they're studying at LSC or have done and therefore are questioning, do I move back to the continent now or, or not? And I think what the future of work is presenting is more opportunities for those who aren't yet ready to move back. Perhaps you have a, you know, a sterling denominated student debt that you need to pay. Um, it gives more opportunities to work in relation to the continent without physically being there. Um, the other thing is, thank you, Kojo, for uh, re repeating the question I didn't hear earlier about the, the skills um, that, that are 
that are needed. Yes, the World Economic Forum talks about 10 skills that are needed based on um, a survey of various organizations for 2025. And as I um, alluded to earlier, the majority of those are around behavioral skills. So it's problem solving, it's self-management, and it's working with people in addition to the use of tech and tech development. Um, and the third point I'll make is regardless of your, whether or not you're an entrepreneur or not, entrepreneurial mindset is incredibly important for the future of work. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Oi. And Kojo, you might just want to highlight, uh, Kojo, as you wrap up um, the two publications that you've mentioned, uh, there are several requests uh, for more details. Uh, one, one, one was a study by WEF, the name I forget, so forgive me, but 2017. Uh, WEF, of course, being the World Economic, World Economic Forum. Forum. Apologies. Yeah. And then, and then the, the, the other is the future of work by the World Bank. Google it and it will come up. It's a, it's a, a really evidence-based um, uh, report on the, on the future of work on the continent. Um, shall, I, shall I sum up super quick, David, or was that part of my 30 seconds? 20 seconds. <laughs> 20. Um, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll finish with what I started with, which, which is the, 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 the threat posed by uh, aspects of the fourth industrial revolution, if that's what you subscribe to as, as what's, what's coming, are real. But in my view, we shouldn't be pessimistic or deterministic about the negative impacts that um, the changes will bring. Um, investments in tech, investments in skilling people, fueling entrepreneurship and building the capacity of those people who will work for some entrepreneurs is super important, as are those social, uh, uh, those, 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 those social nets to capture people. Facebook has invested heavily in parts of that, certainly in broadband, uh, connectivity do look up to Africa if you're interested in connecting the continent definitely in um, uh, uh, training people as well more than 100,000 people trained but at the same time we're aware that bad policy bad bad or non-existent analog compliments as the World Bank puts it might undermine what we're trying to do and that can be bad policy with regard to internet shutdowns bad taxation or inappropriate taxation or indeed things that take away the hope and aspirations of young people on the continent and those speak to the governance issues that um, colleagues have spoken about. Thanks ever so much for the time. Yes, uh, thanks uh, Kojo. Um, the purpose of course of these discussions is not to exhaust the issues or to agree on everything, but it is to um, enable all of us to think more systematically and rigorously about the issues and in this case of course on, on the future of work in, in, in Africa. So my thanks uh, to our panelists uh, for what has been a very stimulating uh, conversation. So thank you, Kenneth, Kojo, Oi, and, and uh, Shami. And also my thanks to the team at the Fios Lange Center for Africa at LSC uh, for organizing uh, the, um, uh, this, this webinar. So thanks again and uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you may be. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks everyone.